Tui, and welcome to Think Outside the Board. I'm now recording my late October monthly update, and the purpose of these monthly updates mainly is to highlight uh, Kickstarters that are running currently that you can go back right now. This is as far as I'm considered the best of the best that's up there on Kickstarter right now. And October has been a really... Uh, there's been a lot of stuff, a lot of good stuff, so much so that I have a list of games that didn't even make the list of the games I'm going to be talking about, and that is uh, two of those games are Plunderous and Wor what's it called? World Adventure Ancient Ruins. Now, both of those projects were canceled. They just weren't funding well enough, um, so they are no longer running. Maybe they'll come back. I think Plunderous had already run once, um, so I don't know if that's going to come back again, but... They may have made it on this list if they hadn't been canceled. And then there are seven other games that I uh, cut from the list just because I didn't want it to get too big. And for various reasons, I just thought these were a little um, not quite on the same level as the other 10 games I'm going to talk to you about, but still really good games. And I just I didn't want to have 17 games to talk to you about. But those games, I'll just throw them out uh, for you because I think they at least deserve a mention, are uh, Crescent City Cargo, the Lost Ones, Mr. Cabbage Head's Garden, and that's actually kind of coming around again. That's been on Kickstarter before. Uh, the Science and Seance Society, Twisted Fables, Unforgiven, The Lincoln Assassination Trial, and Veiled Fate. So, there's just, I mean, I could have been talking about 17 games today, but it seemed like uh, I didn't want to do that many. <laughs> and also, I had reasons for not including each of those. They just didn't feel to me to be quite on the level of these other 10 I'm going to talk to you about. And I like to keep a little bit of mystery about what games I'm going to be talking to you about, so if you if you want to be surprised, you can. But if you don't want to be surprised, you can look down in the, uh, in the tags, and I have everything um, labeled so you can just jump ahead if there's a specific game that you want to hear about. Now, after we talk about those 10 games, I'm also going to talk to you about uh, several games that have arrived. I always kind of do these bonus sections. Um, on, you know, in these videos, and I think that you may not consider them bonus sections, you might just consider them part of the whole video, but because I consider this to be primarily to talk about currently running Kickstarters and to do some of the work for you in identifying what might be some good Kickstarters you may want to look at, I do kind of consider these other sections to be bonus sections. So one of them are games that I've added to my collection since the last video, and I believe this time we have four to six, depending on how you want to view it, and you'll understand when we get there. And then I have three games that I've personally backed since the last video, and then I have only one game this time that I've played uh, since the last video. And, you know, I'll be talking about that one probably a little more extensively than these other games since I'm, I have direct experience with that, and I can talk specifically about uh, my play of it. Anyway, let's get moving. Start uh, the main section of this video with the ten Kickstarters that are currently running that you may want to check out. And uh, one last thing before I do, I'll just also, I know this channel is still very young and I'm still growing an audience, so I think it may be helpful for you to know that I consider myself to primarily be a heavy Euro gamer and I also like games that are uh, cooperative, narrative, storyline, kind of campaign uh, driven. Um, I also do like l some lighter games, like you know, medium light, medium games, because I'm always looking for games that have uh, good consequence, good choices of consequence that can be made by players that are in a, you know, a, a somewhat of a smaller box that doesn't take quite as long to play. And so when I am talking about, you know, medium light games, uh, medium games, even light games, I think there should be an understanding there that these are games that I'm being perhaps even more selective with. So if I'm, if I'm picking out something there, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing the top percentage of those games. So hopefully in respect to lighter games as well, I can kind of point you to the, the cream of the cream and, and even the very light games. Cause I think it's always helpful to have a few games that, you know, you can kind of just whip out at the beginning or the end of a game night when there's not much time left. And I will say that I think right now some of my favorites to do that with are um, Rome by Ryan Laucat, uh, Fort, and Century Spice Road, Azul. Um, 
it's a oh, cat lady. Cat lady is another great one. So those are some of the, you know, oh, it's, no, I did say Century Spice Road, yes. So those are some of the really light games that I like to kind of have at my fingertips in case there's, you know, maybe a half an hour and you want to squeeze in something more. Okay, so let's go on to the main section of the video now. We are going to talk about these games in um, chronological order so that hopefully, I'm recording this video a little later than I usually do. Um, my fiance and I went out of town for her birthday for a camping trip and then we were having some issues with a neighbor and our uh, HOA. And so it's just it's kind of eating a little time. So I'm a few days behind. I don't anticipate that happening, happening in the future. But the first couple games that I'm going to be talking about actually end their uh, Kickstarter campaign tomorrow, which is Friday. I'm recording this on Thursday. And I'm going to try to get this thing uh, filmed and edited so that if you're you know, alerted when this drops, you'll be able to get in there and see the first couple games before, you know, while their campaigns are still alive. Those games are Cartographer's Heroes and uh, Shalia Great Houses. And both of those, as I said, end their Kickstarters on Friday, October 23rd. Now, Cartographer's Heroes, um, there are roll and write games, and I assume most of you know what roll and write games are. Uh, there are also kind of a subgenre of that, which are flip and write games. So in a roll and write game, players generally have some kind of uh, you know, pad they're filling out, some kind of scoring parameters, and then every round, you know, there's dice being rolled, and based on that, they decide to pick certain things on their, you know, sheet. So flip and write is just instead of using dice, there are cards being drawn that give the players, um, you know, something to interact with each round, whether it's, you know, resources or something to write on a map, something to make choices from. And I think personally, my two favorite roll and writes are actually flip and writes. And those two are Cartographers and uh, Welcome To. And I just, I really like cartog Cartographers. I think it's a really, uh, really well designed game. Um, if you haven't played it before, you have a little map and cards are being drawn and you kind of fill in your map in a fantasy themed kingdom. And I just, I like the theming of it. I like the choices. I like the way you get to draw the different terrain on that map in the little fantasy world and the way you're pursuing, you know, different methods of scoring. It just, it feels like a very well, tightly designed uh, little game with, you know, smart, good scoring opportunities. And it's just, it's fun. It's fun to play. So on this new uh, Kickstarter, it's basically a standalone expansion. It's called uh, Cartographer's Heroes. So you can play that without the original base game. Um, there are also three map packs involved in this Kickstarter. So that basically just gives you different kinds of player sheets that you can draw on, different types of uh, terrains and, and, and things. So, you know, in this Kickstarter, you could either back the, just the map terrain packs, or you could, you know, and use those with the original cartographers, or you could get this standalone expansion um, and the map packs, or just the standalone expansion. So I just feel that Cartographers is a great roll and write, and this is another opportunity to get it or get some part of it or, you know, get an expansion or get whatever you're missing, but it's good stuff, okay? Also on the 23rd is Shalia uh, Great Houses, which is an expansion for Shalia. Shalia is a mainly a tableau building game. Um, you're building buildings, I guess, and in that case, it looks like quite a few other games where you're building buildings. Uh, the player mats are kind of neat. They're sort of round and they look, to, they're kind of bordered uh, around the edges by um, what looks like a dirt wall. So, you know, if you're looking at it, it looks like they're supposed to almost be three dimensional. And, you, you know, you're building these uh, eight, I think there's room for eight cards on this kind of tract of you know, raised, a raised platform of land, or it looks like a raised platform of land because of the artwork. Uh, and it's it's not a very uh, difficult game. It's a fairly light game. You're just building these buildings. You're creating this tableau. There is some dice rolling and dice placement that's happening. It's somewhat similar to Machi Koro or Imperial Settlers or uh, 51st State Master Set. 51st State Master Set and Imperial Settlers are basically the same game with a uh, thematic reskin. 
but you know all of these games uh, essentially you're kind of building you're building a tableau there's some kind of take that player involvement some kind of combat between uh, players it was well received when it when the first Kickstarter came out and now they're doing an expansion Kickstarter so take a look if you want this kind of like light combative uh, tableau builder this could be you know, a good game for you to consider now on the 25th of October, Windward completes its Kickstarter, and this is by El Dorado Games. And El Dorado Games, I think they started with uh, the island of El Dorado, not, be, not to be con uh, confused with the Quest for El Dorado. Quest for El Dorado is kind of a deck-building race game. The island of El Dorado, I've actually never played it. Um, I think when it first shipped and people were playing it uh, the very first time, just the base game, there were a lot of claims that it was broken. It just didn't work very well. But since then, they've had two more Kickstarters for it, and they've added a lot to it, and, and I hear it plays well now. Um, kind of like, I think, early on, um, what's this? Uh, Viticulture. I heard the very first version of Viticulture had some problems, and you know they went back to the drawing board a few times and made it better and made it play really, really well. So I think... I think that's kind of what's happened with the island of El Dorado. And then since then, I've been impressed with a lot of their other Kickstarters. They did one called Capone, where players are kind of operating these little speakeasies. Um, and you have a whole little uh, uh, player screen that looks, like, that looks like a speakeasy. And, you know, you're kind of getting items delivered and you're running this little thing in Prohibition. And it just, the theme and the design looked, looked really neat to me. And they also did a game called uh, The Age of Atlantis, which was kind of more Euro-y. Oh, and they also did, you know, Windward once before, because this is an expansion. And Windward caught my eye the first time um, because I could see these guys, the El Dorado guys, uh, growing with their designs and what they were doing. They always had really nice production value, and I think they have a nice aesthetic that they've managed to maintain um, even from their very first game. But it's been a kind of a case of them, I think, getting all the elements together to go from making, you know, interesting and good games to really good games. And, and they're getting there. I think with each game, they're getting there. So in Windward, players are on another planet. They've got these ships and they move around in the wind and they're hunting these cresters, which are like whales. So the main way to win the game is by getting prestige points or victory points. I forget what they call it in that game. Uh, but you're going to do that mainly by killing these, these cresters. I think you're, you're getting the teeth of the cresters is actually how you're getting the, uh, the, the points. And so I think there is a way in the game even to attack other players and steal the teeth from their ships. There are ways you can earn notoriety through achievements. And there's also uh, ways that you can buy notoriety with gas which is kind of interesting. And I think, I mean, gas is what you need to have to, as a resource to power things up. So if you're buying notoriety with gas, you're kind of not using it elsewhere. Um, and the neat thing about it, it's definitely, it's an engine builder. Um, but the neat thing about it to me is that in the middle of the board, there's kind of a wind flag. And that wind flag gets moved periodically throughout the rounds. And whenever players are traveling in their wind ships, if they're ever trying to travel the way you know the way that the wind is going which would just kind of sweep them along they get all you know you get free movement in that direction so i like the whole thematic idea that players are in these wind ships on this uh you know windy planet and you know gameplay wise you're getting a boost from the wind and you so you're trying to each turn you have you're somewhat altering your plans by the way the wind is blowing because the wind is going to turn to determine each time you move uh, where you can get to. So if the wind is blowing one turn in a way where it's going to help push you along, you know you might be able to get to a spot on the board um, in one round that you wouldn't have been able to get to in another round with the wind you know, blowing into you. So I like those kinds of things in games in general when there are uh, mechanics that happen that make you adjust your strategy. I think that's always good. And yeah, so that and the theme just had me interested in this game uh, during the first Kickstarter a year or so ago. But there were a lot of 
games at that time that were even more worthy, I think, of my spending dollar. So I did not back Windward uh, the first time around, and here it is again. It's got this new expansion. Um, there's a new faction in it. There's new events, contracts. Um, more stuff, I think, is always good because if you've played the game and you like it, it's good to get kind of more of everything just so you have more variability in the game. Uh, but the new faction is good as well, and they also have... Uh, their ships move on different elevations, you know, in this world in the air. So there is a third type of ship that operates at a uh, a third elevation in relation to the other two ships that players are controlling. So it adds in sort of a different, literally, different level of gameplay. And I think it's neat that they're giving you more stuff to increase the variability, but then they're also adding on um, some more mechanics. You know, so the game will evolve a little bit. On the 27th, we've got two games. One is called Crash Octopus. And I don't know if you guys have heard of a game out there called Tokyo Highway. Um, it's sort of an action dexterity game. But if you've seen pictures of the gameplay, it's pretty, I want to say neat, but I've overused that word in the past. <laughs> we could say outlandish. Um, but you're kind of building a highway using what looks to be kind of blocks and almost tongue depressors. I mean, it's not those things. The components just look somewhat like those things, but it's the kind of like these abstract blocks and shapes and things. So players are building this huge, looks like a children's toy of this kind of massive sprawling highway system. And I know that game, I think because of its table presence, um, and I also hear the gameplay is good. It's it, it landed well. Gamers like that game. And the designer, or one of the designers of that game, whose name is Naotaka Shimamoto, I think. Naotaka Shimamoto. I hope I didn't butcher it too badly. Um, that, that designer also designed this game, which is an action dexterity game, and it's called Crash Octopus. And it, again, has some table presence. It's pretty interesting looking. Um, players are basically in ships in the ocean, and so the table kind of becomes the surface of the ocean. And also in this ocean, around the players' ships and this wreckage that they're trying to, you know, retrieve and get goods from, is a giant octopus. And this octopus is not a happy octopus. So and the way it looks on the table is you've got this big kind of ball that sits on the table, which is the octopus's head. And then you've got several tentacles and, and limbs coming out. And it's essentially an action dexterity game. So you're, you're kind of flicking things to try to flick goods to get them over your ship. Sometimes you're flicking to move your ships. But the different pieces of the octopus also will end up moving around in the space. And I think what's kind of neat about it thematically is that you never see the octopus. You're just seeing the kind of like dome of its head and the different tentacles and arms. And I mean, it just looks fun and and neat. <laughs> it, it really does. And the octopus will occasionally attack and you'll, I think they're dice and you kind of throw it at the octopus's head, which of course is round. And so they kind of, the dice bounce off in different um, directions and can hit other things. So it's definitely like, I think different than than a game that most people have. I don't know that action dexterity games are really my bag so much, um, but if I was going to play one, it might be this one just because it just looks so unique and and interesting and fun. Um, and then the other game on the twenty seventh is Fantastic Factories, and Fantastic Factories I think may have quite a bit in common with Shalia. Again, it's sort of a, uh, a tableau builder and you're building buildings. Fantastic Factories has been out for a while. Okay, it's not a new game. So the Kickstarter is basically for, and I think you can get the base game in it as well, but it's all about these two new expansions. One of those expansions is called Manufactions, which brings variable player powers into the game. And I mean, that's always a good thing in my mind. I like, I like that, you know, when you're playing a game in the beginning of the game and you Everyone kind of chooses their player cards, player abilities, and then you kind of get to tailor your strategy a little bit uh, for that game. And, you know, it gives, gives more variability, allows you to have somewhat of a focus, and that focus can change from game to game. So Manufactions has variable player powers, 
It also has a uh, new resource card, uh, Vitamins. And then there's a second expansion, also part of the Kickstarter, called Subterfuge. And I think, you know, there's always this uh, criticism level that some games, that they're just multiplayer solitaire, and players are kind of just sitting there looking at their player board, doing their own thing, and there's very little involvement between players. And so I think that's an, uh, I think uh, Subterfuge is an effort to make uh, Fantastic Factories a little more, bring a little more player involvement into the game. And then also in that expansion are, there's a sabotage mechanic. So again, take that. And um, there's also just more stuff, more blueprints and more contractors. So again, they're, they're giving you ways to extend the life of the game if you're already playing it and loving it, you know, kind of just more stuff. And then they're giving you some more, you know, some more mechanics and things. So you're getting sort of a larger breadth of gameplay and I guess deeper gameplay as well. Then on October the 28th is Frostpunk. And Frostpunk is doing really well. I mean, I feel like I need to talk about a game if it's at you know, 1.7, 1.8 million dollars as Frostpunk is. And the reason for that with Frostpunk is because the designer, uh, Adam Kwapinski, is the designer of Nemesis and <laughs> Nemesis Lockdown. And that is a game that is, you know, it's, if you don't, I mean, I'm sure most people have heard of it, but it's like Alien the Board Game, um, except it got made. <laughs> it was a good game. I think there's also an Alien game on its way, but I don't know how good that one is. So kind of Nemesis beat an Alien IP to the punch and it did it well. But it's also a very blingy game. It's got a lot going on. And now that there's this Nemesis lockdown, which takes the same formula, and I think it puts you in a, a bunker somewhere and it kind of changes up the things that are hunting the players. Um, there's like a whole nother game coming out with the same idea behind it, but a different scenario, somewhat of a different theme and just a lot of bling. And I think where um, they really kind of did, did right with Nemesis is that they managed to, and I mean, you can't control this. This is just lightning striking, right? But they managed to make a good game and a game that resonated with gamers, um, you know, serious gamers, <laughs> Euroy gamers like Nemesis. Uh, but it's also a game that's very, very heavily thematic, you know, in the lines of Ameritrash. So they really kind of brought both of those uh, genres together. I mean, I wouldn't really call it a Euroy game, just that it is appearing, appealing to Euro, Euro gamers. So they kind of merged those audiences and they made a really good game doing it and they made an expensive game and then a game that has made them a lot of money. So when, when a designer, you know, has that kind of success on the level of like a Gloomhaven or something, people are taking note, you know, people want to know what his next game is and this is his next game. It's called Frostpunk. It probably doesn't hurt that Frostpunk is also a very successful video game. So this is a, you know, adaptation of an already successful IP and it's from the designer of Nemesis. So it's just, this is probably the game, the Kickstarter of the month just because of that. Um, but it looks like a really good game too, you know, or I wouldn't be recommending it. And there's a lot of miniatures in this game. Um, the video game is, I think like a survival, like a city building survival game. So think, you know, something like SimCity or Cities Skylines, um, but done in this sort of apocalyptic uh, snow, frost uh, environment where there's, uh, everything needs to be heated and, you know, reactors can explode and, you know, there's radiation and things like that that are uh, plaguing the, the environment. And so the video game is kind of like dealing with that, it's sort of a simulation. Um, this board game is not going to try to do quite the same thing. It's going to be more of a Euro game and it just looks really, really good. Again, good mechanics, amazing table presence, very, I mean, I want to say well produced, but also expensively produced. Like it's not, I mean, there's, there's, there's some game to this. There's, <laughs> there's some stuff going on in this game, uh, you know, just production wise with all the miniatures and I think they're doing um, 
their version. It, uh, the company that's producing it is called Glass Cannon Unplugged, and this is their first game, which is, I mean, they've bit off a lot, but they picked a good designer and a good design. Um, so, I mean, there's a high level of production value here, and it's, I mean, it's not as expensive as if you were going all in on Nemesis, especially if you were getting Nemesis and Lockdown. It's not that expensive, but it's not cheap. I think it's, once you throw in shipping and stuff, I think you're getting probably almost up to the $200 level. So it's not a cheap game, but it looks like a very mechanically sound game and also a game with amazing table presence. I think this is a game that a lot of game groups are going to get and just want to play it again and again and again. And, uh, and then just kind of the whole apocalyptic thing with the, you know, the kind of frost burned world. I mean, that's, that's a theme that's, I think, going to resonate with people and they're going to find fascinating and, and want to replay it, at least for a while. I don't know how what kind of legs it's going to have, but it does look like a very solid game. Also, I will say there are a couple of games uh, that came out within this last year. Uh, one of them was Return to Dark Tower. And there was another game which I can't remember the name of. If you know what I'm talking about, you'll remember it. But it was it was very automated. Um, it all had these buildings that kind of had... Um, LED in them, and I think you had to be connected to the internet to play it. Um, not that you'd really use an app in the uh, in the playing of the game, but it would communicate things to kind of like the tower, which is very heavily electronic. And my point in referencing those two games, that and Return to the Dark Tower, is that Frostpunk looks somewhat like those games because it's got this kind of high level of production value with lots of lots of miniatures and it takes place in this you know apocalyptic world the players are kind of like exploring together while they're playing against each other um but it doesn't have the kind of tech dependence that those games do and it doesn't seem to be as fiddly as those games so i think this is maybe a better bet and a safer bet for a lot of gamers than to spend a lot of money on something that's reliant on electronics and, and technology that could, you know, at some point in the future, I mean, those things aren't going to live forever, right? At some point, that technology is going to be replaced. And the question is, whenever that happens, is is the game company going to be supporting that? You know, if, if they're no longer producing the game or they're no longer you know, keeping the app alive that runs the game, uh, then you're just shit out of luck. So, but this is not like that. So I think it looks similar in kind of table presence and scope of those games, but without all of the fiddliness and definitely without the tech dependence. Then on October 29th, there is a new Kickstarter for High Rise called the Ultra Plastic Edition. And uh, this is High Rise's third time around now. The first time around, they just didn't fund. And the original concept for High Rise was that players were going to be building buildings and they wanted to have kind of all these plastic pieces so that you could literally be building up buildings on the table, these giant kind of plastic buildings, and it would have great table presence. But unfortunately, backers just didn't see the value in that uh, originally, the first time around. So they came back, they did a second Kickstarter, and they scaled it back, and they did it with standees. And the standees look neat. I'm going to use that word one again. The standees look neat. Like, they're the art's very um, attractive, and just, it looks good. Uh, but it is a standee, and it's not, you know, the kind of plastic buildings that were first, you know, what the designer wanted in the game. But it got made. It got produced it shipped, <laughs> people played it, and they like it. You know, it's a hit. Uh, I've seen many reviews for High Rise and, and people are very excited about it. So I think, I think in the original two Kickstarter campaigns, it just wasn't, the gameplay wasn't able to be communicated how solid and compelling it was. Um, I know for me personally, it has a time track in it. And if you're not familiar with a time track, they use one in Takedo. They use one in Martin Wallace's Australia. Basically, it means that whoever is last gets to go. And you're kind of following some kind of path. So in High Rise, it's a, it's a loop. You know, it's a normal kind of goes around the outside of the board. 
And when you take your turn, you can basically move anywhere you want on the board. Um, although it does have the board divided into uh, zones, so you actually do have to move out of your zone. But you could move into the next zone, or you could move all the way around the board, kind of you know, to the zone behind you. So you can really kind of choose where you want to go based on the action or the resources or whatever it is that you want to do. Now, in making that choice and remembering that whoever is furthest back gets to go, if you go very far forward, then that means all the other players are probably going to take several turns before they catch up with you and pass you. So I do like that uh, decision-making um, process where you're like, ooh, this thing looks really good, but if I jump way ahead to be able to do that action, I might lose three or four turns while everybody else gets to you know, keep taking turns before they've caught up with me. Whereas maybe I don't really want you know, the action space that's right near me in the next zone, but if I go there, I'll get to go again very soon. So maybe it's worth it just getting that little thing and then you know, not losing kind of like several turns. And the zones tend to be uh, organized so that the better things in the zone are kind of further out at the end of the zone. And then the, the lesser things are kind of like at the beginning of the zone. So that's another thing you have to think when you go into a zone, because you can only take one action in the zone. Even Like I said, even though you're moving wherever you want, you do have to move out of the zone. When you're moving to a zone, there is that kind of like idea of like, well, if I really want the thing, then I'm going to have to go to the end of the zone, which again means that if there are people kind of behind me, um, they're going to get to go before I get to go again, and they may get the good stuff in the next zone. So it's just, it's a good decision-making process. Um, it's smart and it's something I'm growing to really, really like. Whereas I think at the beginning when I first encountered time tracks, I just sort of thought like, oh, that's that's like a roll and move thing. Like, <laughs> who wants that? But it's not, it's, not, it's not a roll and move thing because you are making a choice and there are, you know, ramifications to your choices. And uh, yeah, I, I really love Martin Wallace's Australia, which uses a time track. And then other than that, it's just, you know, your basic kind of medium light Euro. You're getting some resources and building some buildings. And, you know, there are, there are different kind of abilities that you can kind of trigger as you do this. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's another opportunity for people who missed High Rise. And because it has now been successful and it's, you know, people are talking about it, people like it. They're able to go back and they're now making this with all the plastic components that they'd first want to do the game with when they first thought we were going to do, bring this to Kickstarter. So, you know, for players who did buy the game and have it, I think there's some, some pledge level where they can kind of just buy the new stuff that allows them to upgrade with the plastic buildings. Uh, but if you haven't played the game and you're just hearing about it now and it's something that you think you might want, um, you can get it with, you know, all the stuff. All the stuff that they actually wanted to be doing the first time around. Uh, oh, I should also mention there's, um, also in High Rise, there is, they have a, another thing that's interesting to me about the game is they have uh, corruption, which a lot of times as you're taking various actions, the more powerful actions will cause you to take on corruption, I guess, because you're a real estate developer and sometimes you do things that aren't exactly above board, right? So you're taking on corruption as a human being <laughs> and, um... I mean, there's always kind of punishing systems in a, in a lot of games, uh, especially economic games. Martin Wallace is pretty well known for having these sort of very unforgiving loans that can kind of come back and bite you on the ass at the end of the game. So this corruption kind of functions like that. And um, if you don't have any corruption at the end of the game, you will be rewarded. <laughs> Good things will happen to you. You will not be penalized. Um, but if you do want to kind of play around with corruption and be a shady real estate de dealer and, you know, do all of the nefarious things that you want to do, then the one thing that you just need to kind of be aware of is that you just need to not be the slowest gazelle <laughs> trying to escape the cheetah, right? Uh, meaning that the person who's, you know, has the most corruption is going to really get really get skewered at the end of the game. So you can be taking on all this corruption. You just want to make sure that you are not taking on the most of all the players. So I guess it can kind of be a battle between real estate developers 
of who can be as shady as possible without being the shadiest. You know, or you can just play it and be a very above board and, and you know, go that way and see how that works for you. But I like that idea of corruption in the game and I like how they handle it so that it's uh, not necessarily this detrimental thing. It's just you need to not be the, the worst of the worst. Then on October 30th, uh, the new For Sale Kickstarter funds. And, you know, For Sale just has a reputation as being one of these great, very light, very easy to get to the table um, economic games, uh, bidding, auction bidding economic games. And the way that the, um, the regular For Sale game has always worked is that you put out a bunch of cards, the players bid on them. These are generally properties. And then everyone has a hand of properties, and then they use those properties to bid on basically money, you know, checks. Um, I think they're called checks in the game, but it's basically money. So it's just kind of these two uh, strung together bidding things, bidding rounds, and, you know, that's it. That's the game. It's this economic game. So there's two things happening with the new for sale Kickstarter. The first is that there is a kind of redesign for it. It's called For Sale Autorama, and it's the same game. It's just a new theme. Instead of dealing with car, uh, houses, you're dealing with cars. And it's got new art from Quan Chai Maria, and I think he's amazing. He did the art for Dinosaur Island. He did the art for the most recent version of Uh Cryptid is his. He's done a lot of stuff. He's got just a really great style. It's very sharp. It's, it's a little, I mean, he can do realistic art when he wants to, but even then it's, it's got, you know, kind of, it looks very eighties almost. I forget that eighties artist, um, who was big in the eighties, <laughs> who did a lot, of, not, not Roy Lichtenstein. He probably informed this because Roy Lichtenstein was more like in the sixties, but there was an artist in the eighties whose name I'm not remembering who did this, you know, very kind of um, representational art. And Quan Chai is like that. Um, and, and sometimes his stuff is just very, it looks like some of my favorite comic book arts, like, almost like a Mike Mignola uh, who did Hellboy. Uh, people probably know Hellboy, but um, yeah. Anyway, I just like his art. He does great art. So he has done the art for the new kind of automobile themed version of For Sale. And the other thing is that with that new version is included um, I'm not sure what they call them in the game, but they're people. They're like uh, people that help you, agents. Um, and so it actually ends as a new round to the game. So what's going to happen is now players will bid on these agents or helpers, and then the second round will be using those people to bid on the cars, and then the third round will be using the cards to bid you know, amongst the other players on money. So it extends the game a little bit. It gives it a third round, um, which is which is not bad. I mean, For Sale is always considered to be this really great, sharp, tightly designed economic game that plays very fast because it's just two rounds. So this gives you a third round. I mean, it's not. It's still going to be a very fast game. I'm sure it's still going to play in like 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, but it just it ex you know extends the game a little bit. And then they've also produced an expansion for the regular for sale uh, with these personalities. So if you have the old for sale, you could just get this little kind of mini expansion and still have the same, you know, third round for that as you would have if you bought the Autorama version because that is going to have it baked in. Um, so yeah, so that, that funds on October the 30th. Uh, We've got, we've got two Kickstarters left. Um, one is called Campaign Trail, and that, that funds on the 31st on Halloween. And Campaign Trail is a political game. Um, but unlike a lot of political games that you see popping up all the time, especially right now with everything that's happening, there's no political stance in this. So this is not a game where people are trying to make fun of Trump or, I mean, why wouldn't you, right? But I don't it doesn't really serve any purpose because people who hate Trump, which is the majority of America, don't really want to play a Trump game. And people who like Trump don't really want to play a game making fun of Trump. So political games are always difficult, but I think that they're especially difficult right now 
um, particularly these games that are trying to be very topical about it. Um, I think whatever side people are on, they really, they really just do not want to have that political environment in a board game right now. They want to get away from it. Uh, so in general, I think I'm, I, I kind of do want to keep pol political games at arm's length for me personally. All of that said, the reason that Campaign Trail is gotten so much positive feedback is that it's very apolitical. You know, it's a Euro game that works with a political theme, but it's not making statements on anything about politics right now. It is literally just taking the uh, Electoral College and using area control and kind of creating a game around that. Um, and so like a lot of area control games, you know, you're doing things to kind of put cubes on the board and get majority in different states. And then if you have those states, uh, you'll get their electoral votes. And there's kind of a cool uh, score track where there are tiles for all the states. So uh, a state with a lot of electoral votes, something like California, it's a really long tile. And then something that has, you know, only two or three electoral, electoral votes, it's a very small tile. So players on this scoring track will just take all of the, you know, the tiles for all the states they control, and they'll just lay them out. So you'll literally, you're, you will literally see, like, these kind of meters of who's winning, you know, who has the most electoral votes. And as, you know, a player gets a majority in a state, you know, if they take a majority away from somebody else, they'll take that tile off of their, their you know, scoring meter and put it on theirs, and you'll just see everything adjust. And it's, uh, it's I like that idea. I think it's, it's just very visual, and it works really well, so you kind of always know what the situation is. And then it's not just a, you know, simple area control game where you're doing things, you know, to put out cubes. Uh, there's also some ram randomness involved. So there are cards that come out. And then when you're deciding, like, how you're going to spend your resources and, you know, where you kind of want to pay to campaign to be able to add your cubes to states, um, you are doing that based on these cards that come out. And these cards will, you know, reference certain states. And they're, they're very well designed, too. They're like a little map of the U.S. And then the states that that specific card references are, you know, they, they pop on the card. Like they, you know, they're, they're colored and they, they stick out. And so you cannot always campaign necessarily where you want to campaign. You can't necessarily do what you want to do. You are somewhat bound uh, by the cards, which... I like, right? That makes you adjust your strategy as you're playing the game to what's coming out. And that all, for me, that's always a good thing. It you know gives you more variability. So that one uh, finishes on the 31st. And then the final game that I'm going to talk to you about is Tactiki, which ends on November 5th. And I do have other um, Kickstarters that fund after that that I'd like to talk to you about, but we're going to do that in the next video in two more weeks. And I think there's even a game that's funding on November 6th. So that'll be the first and the one that we talk about next video. But to get back to Tactiki, Tactiki is basically like checkers, but everybody has these, everyone, I, it's a two-player game. So both players have these, these tiki heads, and they have 10 of them. And you have, the board is, is five rows. So you're going to have, you know, five tiki heads and then on top of them, five more tiki heads. So you'll have five stacks of two. And each of these tiki heads will have a number one through five. And there will be two of each. So you'll have two ones, two twos, two threes, two fours, two fives. And you get to, you get to arrange them however you want on your side. And only you can see the numbers, you know. And then your player who's facing you like they would in chess or checkers, they've got their ten you know, tiki heads, and uh, they can see their numbers. And so you're allowed to do two moves on your turn. And so you just kind of move these around the board. And whenever you go on to a space that has another opponent, like, I guess in, I mean, in checkers, you would technically jump over someone. But in this game, you're jumping onto them. You will then show the number. And a higher number always beats a lower number unless it's a one, uh, because it kind of wraps around. So a one will beat a five. So one loses to everything except for five, and five beats everything except for one. And then other than that, everything, you know, the higher number wins. So when you attack somebody, you'll reveal both numbers, and then the, uh, the lower number will, 
leave the board, captured. And the goal here is to get a, to build up a stack five totems high, which is fun, right? You're trying to do this tactile thing. Players can bring out uh, units that have been captured, but only if they have an empty space on their, you know, in the row that is directly next to them. So you as an opponent can go over there and start to get your pieces in their, you know, in that row right near them, and then they can't bring out any more, any more pieces. And once, once either player has a stack, you know, five units high on their opponent's row, they win the game. So, I mean, it's simple, uh, and it's an abstract game, and it's a little bit like checkers or chess or onitama, you know. Uh, but I, I really, I like the number thing that they've designed here and, and how the pieces capture each other with that. And I also just like the physical gameplay and, and the stacking. Uh, feels fun to me. So there is, I, mean, I think within these 10 games, we hit several different genres of game, which is definitely kind of always one of the things I'm trying to do is to present the best games out there, but also a range of types of games. So that concludes this section. And now we're going to move on to the games that I have added to my collection. And I said in the beginning at the top of this video that it was four to six games, and here's why, because, well, the first one uh, comes in a very nice box, perhaps too nice of a box, and that is Gugong Panjun. And you can see they actually, this is like a velour box, which I think is kind of a mistake, because if I'm taking this out and taking it places to game days, you know, once once the pandemic isolation <laughs> isn't necessary. If I'm taking this box around, it's going to get a little beat up. So I think the whole velour thing is maybe not the best idea, but it is it is a big box. So it does hold uh, the original Gugong as well as Panjun. And I did play Gugong when, when the original game was kickstarted. I, uh, someone in my gaming group brought it in. And I liked it a lot. You know, it's a worker placement game but it's also it's one of these games that's got like maybe eight different areas on the board and each area scores differently so there's a lot of variability for players to deal with and they can kind of pick their strategies and adjust their strategies it also has a scoring thing like one of the areas on the board in the middle of the board is this track you know where you kind of go up and if you don't get to a certain level on that track then you're not going to score any points in the whole game. So <laughs> that area is a little bit dangerous, but my primary issue with uh, Gugong when I played it is it just seemed to me that the scoring in some of these areas uh, was unbalanced. And I really liked the game. I liked the gameplay, the production of it. It was off the chart. Um, the tiles that they had the, and the design of the tiles and the thickness... It just is a beautiful, beautiful game. So I really wanted to love it, but I was worried about the gameplay of it. I was worried that there was kind of an inherent imbalance between several of the different mechanisms of the game. Um, so I didn't buy it, or I didn't back it first time around. But now with Panjun, which adds several more modules to it, I think there's a lot a lot of room to restore whatever balance I thought was missing. And I mean, I don't even know that I'm right necessarily, you know, it was just my impressions from one play. So now I have the opportunity to play it and to see if I think the balance is an issue and if the Panjun um, expansion fixes that. And if not, you know, I can always sell it, but it's a beautiful, beautiful game. And uh, hopefully they have fix that issue. So that's that's this one. So here's one of my ones that barely doesn't count. This is <laughs> the screen printed ruler tokens for Pax Pamir. And I backed the new edition of Pax Pamir, you know, a year ago, way back when. Oops, I just hit the camera. Sorry there. Um, I backed it last time around, and I think Pax Pamir is a fantastic, fantastic game. It's a, it's a tableau builder, and it does something I've only seen maybe one or two other games do, which is that players don't uh, have player colors or player units. 
So I don't really have pieces that I'm using for me. Um, this is taking place during the Afghan war. And so there are three armies involved and players are kind of like forever switching their allegiance between the three armies. So there's sort of a area control thing going on with roads that are being built and the presence of these three different armies um, in you know, around the map. But no player is forever stuck with any one armor, our army. You can always you know, choose to switch your allegiance. Sometimes there's a downside to switching your allegiance, but sometimes you really want to switch your allegiance the way that the game is going. So it's forever kind of a tug of war between the players playing and you know, the area control that's happening with these three different armies, none of which specifically represent any of the players. And there's just, it's such a well-designed game. And again, it's a very beautiful game. The, uh, the pieces are almost look like uh, those butter mints. I mean, they're, I mean, they're taller and they're rectangular, but they have that pastel look of butter mints. Um, but they're, they're really pretty and they're really well-designed. And then the cards are just, the art on the cards is great. And the quality of the game is top notch. Um, and so, and this is a game I think that, you know, it doesn't necessarily look like the sexiest game. And the board is also a cloth map, which, you know, could possibly, you know, turn off a few people. So I think maybe when the first, uh, when, when it came around Kickstarter the first time, there were people who didn't immediately back it for whatever reason. But this is a game that's been re reviewed really, really well. And I think the more gamers have played it, especially now that this you know new version has such a higher production value than the old version of the game from way back when. Um, it's, it's just been very well received and gamers love it. And so I think they knew, you know, there's going to be a market out there for us to run another Kickstarter campaign. And one of the things they did in that was they did some the ruler tokens that were better produced than the last ones. And, you know, it's just such a good game. And I like... You know, I like the designer behind it, so I wanted to support it and kicked in a few bucks just to get the, the nicer tokens. So that's all that was. I'm not sure that really counts as a game, but if we're if we're counting it as four, then that doesn't count. If we're counting it as six, then that's one of the six. Um, and then the other three to four games are the Of the West Kingdom cycle. So... So first of all, I've got like a promo pack and I've got some metal coins. Um, and then I've got Architects of the West Kingdom along with its expansion. And I waited for a long time to get Architects. And the reason is that when it first kickstarted and then later when I first played it, I wasn't completely mad about the main mechanic in the game which um, if you, these games, Architects, Paladins, and Viscounts of the West Kingdom, um, this is kind of a new trilogy by the company and designer of the, uh, of the North Sea trilogy. So Shipwrights, Explorers, and Raiders of the North Sea. And I think most, most gamers like those games. Uh, maybe not Shipwrights as much. It's, a, it's simpler, but it's also a little more basic and not as compelling, but you know, I still actually kind of enjoy Shipwrights. It's more of a, a card drafting hand management game. There's some resource management and you're trying to build some ships. And then Explorers of the North Sea was this uh, tile laying game, which definitely falls on the lighter end of the spectrum, but it's, it's just, it's a beautiful game. It's got great production value. It's got nice little chunky pieces and the tiles are neat. And it, it's, it's got compelling gameplay choices to make, to be made. So I think, People really like Explorers. It's, it's very well rated. And then, of course, everybody's favorite is Raiders of the Lost Sea. I'm sorry, Raiders of the North Sea, which has that mechanic where you put a worker out and you take an action, and then you pull a worker back and you take an action. So it's a little bit of a different worker placement game because you're kind of getting two actions and you're forever doing this, like, place a worker, pull a worker back. Um, but Raiders is fantastic. I mean, I think it's just pretty universally loved. So, and that was definitely the heaviest of those three games, right? So now we get to their new trilogy, and it was beginning with, with Artisans. Um, 
And I just, I didn't really like the capture mechanic that was very central to that game. And what that was, was uh, when you're playing Artisans, if you go to a place, if you're doing like, let's say I'm trying to get resources, let's say there's a spot that gives me resources. So if I place one of my workers there, I get to take a wood. Then my worker stays there. So later on, during another turn, if I go back there and I put a second worker there, I'm going to get wood for every worker I have there. So I'm going to get two wood. So then maybe on a later turn, I put a third worker there. Well, now I'm going to get three wood. So that means I've now gotten six wood, right? One plus two plus three. And that's neat. I like that. The problem is they've created this mechanic in Artisans where you can capture other people's workers. And it takes a couple steps because there's one step where you go to a spot on the board and you capture workers from anywhere you want. So you kind of take those back, you put them in your player board, and then on a future turn, you can go to the jail and drop them off at the jail and you get some rewards for doing that. I think maybe some money. And if you have players in the jail, you can later go to the jail and retrieve your workers as well. Okay, so that's kind of how that mechanic works. My problem was I just found it in, in, intensely frustrating <laughs> because you'd have a situation where like, I need seven wood. I need seven wood to do the thing I want to do. Okay, so I take a turn, I get my one wood. I take another turn, I get two wood. I take another turn, I get three wood. Now let's say I don't need seven wood, let's say I need uh, ten wood. Okay, so I take another turn, I get my three wood. Now that's, that's six wood total, one, two, three, but I still need that remaining four wood. Now what would happen to me, I mean always, because once you have more than a few people at a place, it becomes too powerful an action for the other players to allow to stand. So once you've got three workers or four workers sitting on a place, they're going to get sent to, to jail. But let's say I needed that 10 wood. I just spent three turns getting this first six wood, and I'm going to use my fourth turn to get my last four wood. Now, if someone, you know, takes my workers away, well, now I have to start over. So now to get that remaining four wood, I'm going to have to put another worker there. I'll give me one wood. And then I'll have to put a second worker there. So that'll get me two wood. So now I've got three wood. Now I have to put a third worker there. And, and now I've got the 10 wood because that third worker would give me three. So now I'd have 12 wood. But that took me six turns to do instead of four turns. Plus, I'm going to need to take a turn to go to the jail to get my people back whenever whoever took them dropped them off. And, and it might not be right away. They could hold on to those workers for a while. And so I just I found that whole mechanic fairly frustrating. <laughs> And so Artisans for me was not something I was going to rush out and add to my collection. However, I do like Shem Phillips and I do like Garpel games and I do want to support them. And I do generally like their games. So the question is, is knowing that that mechanic works that way, will I have more of a fun time with the game later if I can go into it just knowing that? And I think the answer to that is yes. The question is, though, do I want to necessarily bring, you know, put, play that game? Do I want to bring that game to the table? Or would I just rather play another game, right? Another worker placement game that doesn't have a mechanic that I have to get over. Um, and, you know, Raiders of the North Sea is a great game. And by all accounts, so are these other two games. And these are the other two games in the series. Uh, now, this is Paladins, Paladins of the West Kingdom. I also passed on this one when the original Kickstarter was up for Paladins. And the reason was I knew it was going to be a trilogy. I think there were a lot of other games that I was backing at the time, and I just didn't want to... I said, you know what? I'm going to wait. I'm just going to wait for the final game, and I'll just get everything together. I'll just have to pay shipping once, which will be cheaper, and I'll just get all three games then. And... Um, I have not paid, I have, like I said in the top, I have played um, Artisans once when it came out. I don't know if we used the expansion at the time. I don't know if the expansion existed. Um, yeah. I mean, I liked it okay, but I didn't really like the capture mechanic. Now, in Paladins, it's, it's different. There's other stuff going on in Paladins. Um, first of all, the main player board is very small. It's kind of like this track, and there are these, these cards that come out, and you kind of reveal a card each round. I think there's eight or nine rounds. And, you know, those those cards that are revealed can give you... I think in the beginning they give you um, 
resources. And then later on in the game, as they come out, they give you scoring opportunities or scoring goals. So, but it's a, for a main board, it's very small. It's just this like long track that you, you know, have line up some cards with. Instead, each player has their own board, and the player boards in Paladins are huge. Like they look almost like each each individual player has their own game board in front of them. They're they got gigantic, which I actually kind of like. <laughs> and we talked about that, or I talked about that when I was talking about monsters on board. Again, that game, which also had Miko art, had this kind of like enormous player board, and uh, it had to do with tech trees. And Paladins is kind of like that as well. There are just kind of all these areas on your board, and you know there are like eight or nine different ways you can score points, and you're you're kind of building things. Um, in different areas on the player board. Um, but in all the different sections, you have to get deep into that section to really score points. So if you kind of do a little of everything, you're really not going to score any points. You need to really kind of pick one or two um, of the mechanics on the player board to really focus on. And you're going to want to dive deep into those areas, um, uncover everything you can in those in those trees or those unlockables, and you know go all the way to the end of those where you get the... The big points. Um, but whatever you decide to pursue in any game is going to be, you know, very much influenced by what's happening in the game. Um, you know, what might be a good thing for you to pursue in one game based on what's happening in the game may not be, you know, the thing that you'd want to pursue in a different game if the circumstances were different. And I always like games like that a lot. A, a game that gives you, like, a bunch of systems and then it's kind of up to you in any given game to decide how you're going to be most efficient with the set of mechanics within what's happening gameplay-wise. And I feel like there are always just lots of good, crunchy decisions to be made. So I'm, I'm super excited for Paladins, and you know I had to wait a little extra to, to play this one because I was waiting for... Viscounts to come out. Now, Viscounts again is is different. Um, again, they're doing something different in Viscounts. So in Viscounts, you've got this uh, very big kind of meeple guy on a horse, and he travels around a circular board. I mean, it's really a rondelle, and uh, he's going to be taking actions, but he has to follow kind of a certain path. And then there's also kind of this deck building element where you're always going to have three cards on your player board, and those three cards are going to determine um, various aspects of your turn. But every turn, you are cycling cards through this, this little three-card tableau. So something's going to go off and something's going to go on. And so there's a very kind of interesting um, interplay between this kind of like this rotating card system and then this kind of like rondelle action taking system. And then in the middle, there's this kind of smaller rondelle that I think is kind of like a, an area control thing for end game scoring. But I'm, I'm fascinated by the gameplay of it and I think it looks very, very, very solid. So, I mean, at the end of the day, maybe I would consider, uh, you know, selling shipwrights and keeping explorers or raiders. I mean, raiders is very much considered the, the best game of three, I think, by most, but explorers is still a really good game. Um, so at some point in the future, I may end up selling, like, one game each of the series, and if I sold uh, one of these, it would be artisans. As I explained, it's not really my favorite. But the other thing that these games do really well is they... For the first uh, series, for the Of the North Sea series, they had Rune Saga, which allowed you to play all three games together as a kind of like campaign almost. And Rune Saga would bring um, different scoring opportunities into each of the games. And then at the end of each of the three games, you kind of add up all of these like meta points that you got in each of the games. And there could kind of be like an overall winner. And... So they did the same thing for the of the North Kingdom games, and they made Tome Saga, which again allows you to string all three games together and then play them as a campaign. The cool thing about Tome Saga is that it also lets you play every one of those three games in a cooperative mode. 
And I'm not sure if that's cooperative mode just with two players or if you can do it with more, but either way, even if it's just two players, I think it's a really, a really great little addition here, which will just give you so much more gameplay. I know for me personally, sometimes my fiance doesn't, sometimes she gets tired of competitive games and she tends to you know, prefer cooperative games. So I think the fact that we can play these games together, um, almost like a solo game, but us playing together against the game, I think that's something that will definitely get used. And I really like the fact that they, you know, added that kind of game mode and, you know, included that within, you know, the, the thing that allows you to also string everything together into a campaign. So if we're counting, if we're counting this, that's the sixth game. If we're not, if we're not counting this and we're not counting PAX Premier, that's four games. But that, that brings us to the end. That's what has arrived here since the last video. And that then brings us to the section where I tell you what did I actually back uh, since the last video? What did, where did I put my money? And I can tell you that I backed the Seventh Citadel because I really, really like the Seventh Continent. And I think the Seventh Citadel is uh, going to be even better. It's sort of an advancement, I think, in some of the gameplay mechanics of Seventh Continent. Um, and I'm really excited about it. And I also backed Dinosaur World. And I was on the fence with Dinosaur World uh, because I have played Dinosaur Island, which I like, but I don't love because I don't think it really advances the genre. It's just a very fiddly worker placement game with a very bright theme, which I personally really like, um, and, and lots of chunky tactile stuff to deal with. Um, and I, I do enjoy the gameplay. It's just not... It's not compelling. It didn't do anything new with the genre. And it's a big box game. It takes up a lot of space on the table. So I've just, I've never bought it, although I've considered it. Um, so this seemed like this might be an opportunity for me. And in looking at the gameplay of Dinosaur World, um, I think it's a little bit smaller on the table. It's perhaps a little bit less fiddly and simpler in what it's doing, but I think it also gives players more choices um, the tile building that's happening in Dinosaur World is with hex tiles and you're doing things like you've got a, a jeep meeple called the jeeple that you're using to tour visitors around the park to see the different inter, uh, attractions and so the placing of the tiles is more strategic now that you're using those tiles to you know go through with your jeep and I figured I'll get it, I'll check it out, I'll see if it's uh, an advancement on Dinosaur Island. Um, my fiance has still not played Dinosaur Island since I never acquired it, and I think she would actually really like it. She's a huge Jurassic Park fan. Um, so I think this might be the way to scratch that itch, and we'll just have to see how it compares to Dinosaur Island and if it is indeed a keeper. But I think, I think there's so much um, public love for the Dinosaur Island franchise that I don't think I'll have too much trouble selling it if I, in the end I decide it's not really for us. So I, I backed that one. And then the last thing that I backed was uh, the new Thunderstone Quest one, The Enemies Among Us. And I think I mentioned in a previous video that um, I didn't think I was going to get the, need to get the third big box because I do have the other two big boxes for Thunderstone Quest. And it seemed like maybe it was extraneous. But once I started looking at it and I realized like, oh, I don't have all the cards uh, sleeved. And once I do, it's going to you know make the cards take up more room. And then once I also thought about all the tiles, you know, the, the room tiles that you use in Thunderstone Quest and, and the space that that does take up in some of the boxes, I thought, you know what? I think I am going to need that third big box, especially if they do any, you know, more small uh, Kickstarters for it. I'm going to also need room for those. So I did go ahead and I did get the, the big box solution that comes with that, which I think was the right thing to do. So those are the three Kickstarters that I backed, which brings us to the final section of this video. And so I might actually get this done in under an hour with editing. Uh, and that is Lords of Waterdeep, which strangely I had never played. I mean, I've been in this hobby now for several years. Um, and Lords of Waterdeep just seems to be one of those kind of gateway games that a lot of people hit early on. And somehow I didn't. 
Um, I went to the gallerist pretty fast. <laughs> and then there was anachrony and there was just no going back. Um, but I always heard good things about Lords of Waterdeep. And I do, you know, I, I want to have some really good, um, really, you know, good medium light to light games with, with choices that I can bring out with, you know, friends that aren't huge gamery friends. Um, and also that, you know, my fiance and I can play more easily and quickly. And so it finally got around to Lords of Waterdeep. And now here's the other thing. I, I did back Yeto, um, the, the kind of new Kickstarter, the Master Deluxe set for uh, Yeto. And Yeto is kind of looked at as like a Lords of Waterdeep killer because it's very, very similar gameplay wise, but there's, you know, I think I'm more going on with it. So I don't know if I'll end up keeping Lords of Waterdeep forever. Um, I do have the Scoundrels of Skullport expansion for it, so I need to try it out with that as well. And then I need to play Yeto. And I think when I do finally play Yeto, I probably will do some sort of a comparison video because I think that's something that would be very valuable for people. Um, so we'll see, we'll see. But for now, as for Lords of Waterdeep on its own, like I enjoyed it. You know, it's it's just a simple game where you're you're getting resources and you're building buildings. Although in this case, the resources aren't, you know, coal and wood and, and like you would have in a lot of worker placement games, the resources are actually adventurers. So when you build a building, you're just paying money to, to build a building. But then to take various actions and do things, you're going and you're recruiting cubes, colored cubes, which are clerics and fighters and wizards and rogues. And you're using those adventurers to go out on quests. So it's um, like instead of you know, using wood, stone, and straw to build buildings, you're using these adventurers to go out and do quests. And it's kind of neat. It's like you're kind of a merchant in town, perhaps, and you're sort of hiring these you know, fantasy characters. And the idea is that if you send them out on a quest, the quest succeeds, right? So you just need to have the workers to do it. But, you know, it's an area control game. It's a resource management game. And, you know, there's stuff that has to do with the cards as well. So you're kind of managing the cards. And I like it. It's a very, very solid game. Um, I do think in my gaming experience, I may have gotten to it too late. I mean, it's not the nicest produced game. I mean, it's fine for what it is, but... I mean, there's so many games these days that are just gorgeous and have off the charts production value and Lords of Waterdeep is just, you know, cardboard tokens and cards and tiles. It's not, there's nothing great, you know, there's nothing lavish about it, which is fine. And I think for the gameplay, it certainly, you know, doesn't need all that and it plays well with what it has. Um, but I will have to see as time goes on if that's a game that I want to keep or not. I think... I think that even though it's solid, I think a solid game just may not be good enough to stay in the collection um, because I am at a point now where I need to get rid of a lot of games. <laughs> I need to sell some games and make room for the new stuff that's coming in. So I need to play it more, but I did really enjoy it and I would definitely recommend it to anyone, especially if you are like a person or you have a family who plays a lot of you know, medium light games, and you like games that are more on that end of the spectrum. I mean, it's a very, very solid, good game to have in your collection. I think that's, I don't think I'm saying anything new. I think that's very, very well known, which is why it's so widely popular, um, which is why it's a little weird that it's my first time to actually play it. But I did really, really enjoy the experience of it, and I'm looking forward to playing it again. I just think that its time may have already passed. <laughs> So I think that brings us to the end of this video. Um, I will be doing another one in less than two weeks now since this one's gonna be going up a little late. Um, the next video should be going up uh, two weeks from Tuesday, that's a couple days ago. So like whatever the first Tuesday of November is, that'll be when, when the new um, twice monthly update goes up next. Um, and that'll have more currently running Kickstarters, um, perhaps more games that came, perhaps more games that I backed, although I don't think I'm gonna be back in too many games in the next period. Um, and then hopefully I will get to play more than one game between now and the next video. Oh, I should just also mention that in addition to this YouTube channel, I also run a website called Think Outside the Board where I'm currently publishing two Kickstarter columns. One's a sort of daily roundup, it's called Previously on Kickstarter and I, I try to include most of the Kickstarters that launched the previous day. 
Although I do, I do do some amount of, I don't know, quality control, I guess, and what I'm in what I'm showing you. And then the other is called Kickstart This, and it's just more of a pure recommendation column. Now, the one thing I will say is that I think the future of my 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 doing this um, does lie more in videos and in teaches and playthroughs and things like that. And unfortunately, the columns do require a lot, a lot, a lot of time. And I think they are pretty valuable because uh, if you don't want to have to deal with all the glut of Kickstarter, you can just go to my website, see everything that's kind of come out, you know, that's that's of worth, hopefully. And, you know, just have that information, you know, quickly instead of having spent a lot of time perusing through Kickstarter. So I think it's kind of an invaluable service, um, but it does take a lot of time to maintain and... I think my my energies in the future may be spent more on videos and I think I may be able to do some of what I'm doing in the columns in videos. So by all means, please go check out the columns now. If you love them, let me know. You know, if you want them to stay around, let me know because I think over the next month or two, at least as a trial, I'm probably going to be um, phasing out the columns somewhat and moving into doing more and more videos because I'd really like to be getting up, you know, three, five videos a week. And, and as I said, I think that's kind of where the, where the future lies. But I don't want to leave people hanging if they find the columns really valuable. So, you know, if you do, just let me know in comments somewhere, whether it's at thinkoutsidetheboard.com or whether it's here in the comments of this video or in the comments of any of my videos. And I'd also like to ask you if you enjoyed this video and you found it helpful, um, please like it, perhaps consider subscribing. And if you have subscribed and you want to be notified whenever I post a new video, which should be more and more, then you can also hit the alarm bell. And finally, before I get that next monthly video up in two weeks, next week is the week I'm going to try to get uh, the teach done for the seventh continent and possibly the first playthrough video. So I've been working on those behind the scenes for a little while and trying to juggle it with the columns, but I'm really hoping I'm going to get them done uh, in the next, you know, before the next monthly update or bi-monthly update really. Um, but that's it. So this has been a production of Think Outside the Board. I'm Brian Tui, and thank you very much for your time and just kind of hanging out and listening to me talk about games. Um, and really any, anything, you know, any engagement you want to do, any questions you have for me, just let me know in the comments. I'm happy to answer any questions and I'd love, you know, for, for more conversations to begin, you know, out of, out of these videos and the things that I'm talking about. So I encourage you to do that, but thank you again. And I will see you next time.